Ha'azinu. Give ear, listen up. It's a nice Torah portion. Deuteronomy chapter 32, 1 to 52. I did teach on this last week. This is the song that Moses sang. In fact, we, we talked about this quite a bit last week. This is the song that God gave Moses to sing before the children of Israel. The song was an indictment. We talked about this, how the song was effectively, in essence, a timeline. Three, three aspects of the timeline. One, God will judge Israel for their iniquity. Two, he will have compassion on them and he will begin the process of bringing them back to the land. And three, he will judge the nations. The last aspect of that third portion or the third aspect of uh, the last part of that third aspect of the, the sound of Moses is that the nations will rejoice with his people. And we took, we took a look at that last week. So tonight, I want to give you an additional Hebrew word. Well, the Hebrew phrase for tonight is, again, ha'azinu, which is to listen up. But the additional word I want to give you is the word that we find in, in tonight's Torah portion, which is in Hebrew, nacham. Nacham, it means, well, it's represented in tonight's Torah portion in the New American Standard as compassion. But it's actually to console or to give comfort. Nacham. It's... it's it's, it's found in the sound of Moses. And again, in the King James, I'm not sure what it is. Maybe you can tell me what it says in the King James there in chapter 32, verse 36. I want to see if the King James got it right again. Chapter 32, verse 6, it says compassion in my Bible. Mm -hmm. So, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 36 in the King James, what's that word? Compassion. Compassion. It's wrong. Well, it's not wrong. It's only used once, actually, in the Bible as compassion in the Hebrew. It's actually comfort, which is fine. It's good. But there's a difference. Compassion is compassion, but the comfort, the console. So, I like what it says there towards the, well, the middle part of the song, chapter 32. Chapter 32, verse 36. For the Lord will vindicate his people, speaking of the vindication that he will bring uh, when he brings judgment against the nations, and he will have compassion or he will comfort his servants, his people, when he sees that their strength is gone and there is none remain in bond or free. So that's our word for tonight. Second word of Hebrew word, nacham. So I have some points of interest three of them, but I'll, I'll narrow them down to two points of interest. It's really actually two points of interest. First point of interest has to do with God's final word to Moses before he commands Moses to die. You know the story, and we'll see that tonight. His final word to Moses, and we'll see how Moses was, uh, was again in chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, how he was pleading with God about God allowing him to come into the land, to be able to set foot into the land of Israel. But God said no. So we'll take a look at that here in a few moments. Also, the second point of interest and third point of interest has to do with what I'm referring to as the grand Sukkot. A Sukkot after seven years, seven years of Sukkot celebration comes a grand Sukkot. And this, what I'm calling a grand Sukkot, has to do, about, has to do with the time when debts are released. They're remission, remission of debts. If, you're, if you have a debt, it would be completely remissed. So this is why I call it a grand Sukkot. Every seven years, this is the Sukkot that Israel was commanded to celebrate. So we will look at the symbolism of that. There's some symbolism concerning this grand Sukkot that's important for us to consider. So really just two points. Let's look at the first point of interest here as it relates to God's final word to Moses. Let's read what God says to Moses, chapter 32 again, 48 to 52. The Lord spoke to Moses that very same day, saying, now a lot is happening on this day, right? Moses began the day in the tent of meeting. We saw this last week. Uh, hoping to wrap up his message, his presentation to Israel and to, to, to go about his business, which was to die. But God had something different planned for him that day, which was to bring an indictment against Israel with song. 
and also the day when he would die. So God, God brought a lot into Moses' Moses's life on that, on that particular day. The Lord spoke to Moses that very same day, saying, Go up to this mountain, to, the, to, the, to this mountain of the Abarim, Abarim, uh, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, opposite Jericho, and look at the land of Canaan, which I am given to the sons of Israel for a possession. Then die on the mountain where you ascend, and he, got, and he will gather you, excuse me, and he will gather you to your people, as Aaron, your brother, died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. You know, one time I'm going to do a careful study of what it actually means to be gathered to your people. We see it several times in, in the Bible, particularly in the Torah, where someone dies and they're gathered to their people. It's interesting that God says to Moses, you will be gathered to your people like Aaron was gathered to his people. Seems like they would be the same people because they're brothers. I'll, I'll have to research that and maybe one day try and do a presentation on that. It's just interesting. So, because you broke faith with me in the midst of the sons of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, because you did not treat me as holy in the midst of the sons of Israel. So, this here is effectively punishment. Punishment upon Moses that he would not enter into the land. We saw at the beginning of Deuteronomy, as I said just now in chapter 4, 3 and 4, that Moses inquired to, to, to be able to come into the land. Th chapter 3, actually, he pleaded with God, and God will not let him come into the land. So this, this is effectively punishment. Now, what did Moses do? He did not treat God as holy. He did not relate to God in a faithful way. It's interesting that, that in verse 51, because you broke faith, the word faith there is not emunah, because the word emunah is faith in Hebrew, but the word that's used there for faith is actually ma'al, ma'al, which is to trespass. You broke faith. You trespassed against me, is what he's saying, in the midst of the sons of Israel. For you, for you shall see the land at a distance, but you shall not go there into the land which I am given, the sons of Israel. Moses deeply, deeply desired to go into the land. He stated that at the beginning of his message. It was sort of a part of his introduction of this incredible message. He wanted to go into the land, but God will not let him. The sin, what, what, what exactly was the sin? God gave Moses to speak to the rock at Meribah. What happened at Horeb? The first time that the rock was struck, water came forth. This now is some, some, some years later, or some time later. I'm not sure how, how much time, actually. This is some time later. Israel, Israel now is on their way to Kadesh Barnea, and they cry out to God. No water. God instructs Moses to strike the rock. No, he didn't. He instructed him the first time at Horeb to strike the rock. The second time that Israel cried out for water, he instructed Moses to speak to the rock. To address the rock, speak to it, and the rock will bring its water. Moses did not, of course, he did not obey God, and he struck the rock twice. The rock did bring its water forth, but as a result of that disobedience, that, that ma'al, that trespass, Moses is unable to come into the land. God punishes him, chastises him for it. So what I want to do is I want to go back now, because there's a certain point I'd like to make here. I want to go back to the beginning here of Deuteronomy where Moses introduces that, that reality that he wanted to come into the land, but God won't let him. So in chapter 3, mm -hmm, verse 25, let me, I pray, here's Moses now entreating God. Let me, I pray, cross over and see the fair land that is beyond the Jordan, that good hill country and Lebanon. <clears throat> so, let me say this. There was not a country at that time called Lebanon. Our, the, the, Lebanon did not exist. In fact, Lebanon exists today because Moses referred to that land as hill country and Lebanon. Back when I, I talked about this a few weeks ago, I said that the word Lebanon really means white top. White top. 
Now, I said to you then that it's more than likely referring to, to Mount Hermon and the mountains surrounding Mount Hermon in the Golan, because those are the mountains that in the winter time and even in the, in the spring will have white tops. In the summertime, they would not. Unless it had a very, very long and extended cold winter, uh, they would not have any white tops on those mountains. But come, come winter, the mountain tops will become white. More than likely, that's where the word Lebanon comes from, white top. So Moses wants to see the Lebanon, the, the snow-covered mountains. He wants to see the, the hill country, the good land. What, at what period was Israel about to enter into the land? It was spring. It was, during, it was close to Pesach. So yes, that mountaintop would have been covered with snow. He desired to see Mount Hermon, the Golan, and the surrounding mountains. Let's look into that a bit. So, wanted to see these white-covered mountains. By the way, the, the root word for Lebanon is Leban. And the root word means to be whitened or to purify. Now think about that for a moment. The root word for Lebanon, which is Laban, means to be whitened, purified. Did something like that happen on Mount Hermon? What do you think? We call it the transfiguration. You know what I'm referring to. Jesus went up Mount Hermon, and on Mount Hermon, he was transfigured. What, did, what, did, what does the account give us? That his garments turned white as a fuller's white, whitening. You know what a fuller is? How many of us do not know what a fuller is? You don't know what a fuller is. In, in, in all England, a fuller is someone whose responsibility was to make clothes white. That's, that's what a fuller is. He had special soaps. Usually the soap was blue. And when you use that soap on the garment, it gives it a very white, a very white appearance. So the account that we find in the gospel with Jesus up on the mountain is that his clothes became white. He was purified on that Leban, on the Lebanon. Now I'm not saying the country Lebanon. Again, I'm speaking of the mountaintop or the mountaintops that Moses referred to. So why is this relevant? You should, be, you should be able to see relevance already. Because it was Moses who God sent to speak to Yeshua, the rock. Isn't, isn't that what happened? God did not allow Moses in the flesh to enter into the land to see the white top mountains, Lebanon. But as the word of God, the rock itself, went up the mountain, Moses was allowed to go speak the word. Whereas he didn't speak the word that time at Meribah, he struck the rock and, and offended God. God gave Moses an opportunity to go up the Lebanon and speak to the rock, and Moses did. And the rock did what? Released its water. You, you, you see what I'm saying? What happened on the cross as Jesus was pierced through? Water, blood, right? He spoke to the rock. You see, God gave Moses a second chance. And that's the God that we serve. How badly did, did Moses offend God? Pretty badly. That Moses pleaded with him. Pleaded with him. And God said no. In fact, God got annoyed with him and said, don't talk to me about this again. What he didn't say to Moses is, I've got a plan for you. That goes way beyond you in this flesh standing on the Lebanon, on the white top mountain. I've got something really special for you. When you will go in the spirit and speak to the very rock itself, the rock of salvation, Yeshua Jesus, and he will be transformed. So there's a direct correlation between the root word for Lebanon, Leban, to be made white or to be whitened, and what happened with Jesus on that mountain. Because his clothes became white on that very mountain. What does all this mean? It means that God is faithful when we are not so faithful. God is faithful to his people. But we must trust him. Moses ultimately had to trust him. But we must trust him. Now, in the case with Moses here, 
Moses ended up blaming Israel for the fact that he couldn't get in. Didn't he? We said this a few weeks ago when we read the account. He said to Israel, it's because of you that I'm unable to go into the land. God blinked at it. God just said, okay, you're not getting this right, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you anyway. <laughs> no, it wasn't Israel's fault that Moses was unable to enter the land. It was his own doing, his own shortcoming, his own sin. See, what we see there in Moses that is that Moses is very much a man. He is very much human and unable to embrace the reality that he transgressed against God. Israel were not, they were not the ones who transgressed, he did. He didn't take responsibility for his position as a leader, which is something that men, let's be honest, men, we have a difficult time doing, don't we? We do have a difficult time embracing responsibility for, thing, for the things that we are responsible for. And we see that very clearly in Moses, but God, God is a faithful God, and God blessed Moses tremendously. So Moses and Elijah went up that mountain, or descended upon that mountain, and carried out this incredible work on behalf of God, spoke to the rock. The rock brought forth its water, the water of life. So now let's look at this second point as it relates to the grand, what I'm calling the Grand Sukkot. This, this now, we're going back now to the portion from two weeks ago, where we want chapter 31. Yep. In chapter 31 now, we're going to look at this, this special Sukkot celebration, one that comes every seven years. We're going to talk about the symbolism as it relates to this. So in chapter 31, I'm going to read 9 to 12 for us. So Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord and to the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the time of the year of at the time of the year of remission of debts at the Feast of Boots. So this time is around the time of the Feast of Boots, the time of the remission. When all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at, that, at the place which he has chose, which he will choose, excuse me, you shall read this law in front of, the, in front of all of Israel in their hearing. So every seven years there's a special Sukkot when debts are released, remission of debts. It happens once every seven years. So the number seven, we know, has great significance in the Bible, right? There are seven days in a week, and then comes the end, of, the end of the week. Shabbat is the seventh day, and then comes a new week, a new beginning. What else is the number seven significant of or, or symbolic of? Many, many, many examples of what, of what seven is all about the importance of seven. Seven, we say, is the number of completion, the number of perfection. I don't think we fully understand the true significance of the number seven as it relates to God's, God's, uh, God's, God's doings. We just don't know the fullness of it. But we say it's, it's perfection. It is, it is the, the number of God's completion, and it, it probably is. But I think it goes way beyond that. So we believe, uh, those of us that are, uh, believing in a, a seven day or 7,000 year redemption process, those of us that believe that, that that's actually what's happening, we believe that God will redeem creation in seven days, a day being a thousand years. So where are we at now, right now on that, in that process? Where are we at right now? If, if that's true, and that's not necessarily true, but some of us believe that, I certainly believe it, that God is going to redeem his creation in a seven day. Everything was created, right, in six days, and he took a Shabbat, right? We know that. Six days he created, the seventh day he rested. Uh, creation fell into rebellion, or into, into sin, subject to sin by man. And then God has determined a seven day process to redeem all of it. Again, a day being a thousand years. That's, that's what I believe. Of course, you can differ, you can believe otherwise. Now, a 7,000 year process of redemption. At the end of the 6,000 year, or the sixth day, will come, obviously, a Shabbat. 
So where are we at right now in terms of, in terms of that, that, that process of redemption, folks? We're coming to the end of the sixth day, aren't we? It depends on who you, who you consider as being accurate. Uh, in, in the Jewish world, we're about 50, 60 years away, I think, or a little more than that, I'm not sure. Um, from, a certain, from another point of view, we're not far away from the end of the sixth day, which would mean that we're looking at the seventh day of redemption, which is the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom is, in fact, a thousand years of Sukkot, in the sense that God will be, his, his tabernacle will be here. He will dwell with us in Messiah Jesus. Uh, let, me, let me say it another way. He will dwell with us, God will dwell with us, in Yeshua and the bride. The bride, the bride of the Lamb will become a living temple in Jerusalem, his sanctuary, Jesus will be there representing the very person of God. God will sukkot with man once again for a thousand years. This is the millennial kingdom. This is the, 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 the millennial, the 1,000 years of sukkot. That's how I see it. At the end of that, what comes? What comes at the end of, of the 7,000 years of redemption? A new creation, all right? And that's, that's what? That's eternity. It is an eternal existence of God's dwelling place once again in the midst of his creation. Yes, he will redo his creation. God will make all things new. All things will be done away. Isaiah chapter 65, 66. Very clear. All things will be done away. God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. But it comes at the end of this 7,000 year or 7 day process of redemption. Then comes eternity. There will be no more counting of years following that. All we will have is from Shabbat to Shabbat and from new moon to new moon. That's what it says in Isaiah chapter 66. The only thing we will consider is from new moon to new moon, from Shabbat to Shabbat celebrations. The years are done. The time of counting the years are over because redemption is complete. We will just celebrate we will just celebrate Sukkot forever, forever and ever during, in, that, in that new creation. So let's, let's think about it. Jesus comes, right? And, and if we're at the end of the sixth day, we're expecting him to come soon, shouldn't we? <laughs> shouldn't we? If, if we're at the end of the sixth day, any time now, he should arrive. It could be next week. It could be... Ten years from now, it could be 50 years from now. At any rate, he is on his way. He's, he's about to bring an end to this six days or 6,000 years of redemption. It's going to end with a bang, literally. It's going to end with a bang. In the same way, a Friday comes to an end. So most, most Fridays are pretty hectic, right? For me, they are. Most Fridays are pretty chaotic leading up to Shabbat. It seems like the closer you get to Shabbat is the more hectic and the more uh, chaotic sometimes things can get. Well, that's symbolic of the struggle that will come before the millennial Shabbat, the millennial Sukkot. It's a struggle. And that struggle we call Armageddon. We can see it building in the world today. You don't have to have great discernment or great spiritual eyes to recognize that. It's happening. It's happening right now, folks. We have a situation in the world where our government is advocating a nuclear war with Russia. I hate to bring such news, but that's exactly what's happening. If there were kids in the room, I would not talk about this, but everyone, everyone in, the, in this room, I think, is equipped to hear it. Our government has been provoking Russia for 12 years, 12 years at least. And how have they been provoking Russia? By tempting Putin into a conflict in regards to NATO and the Ukraine. So when, 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 Russia, when Russia took down that wall and the great communist system came to an end with Gorbachev, when that happened, the agreement was then that Russia will leave you alone, will not interfere with Ukraine or the neighboring states. We are not going to try and push our 
our hegemony on you, we'll just, you'll survive and we'll survive. Well, since then, the Ukraine has become a tool in the hands of the West to provoke Putin. Why? Because we want a conflict with Russia. That's been the case for 15 years. We've been provoking Russia. Why would we do such a thing? Because there's no room in, in the new world order for Russia. Putin has stated very clearly many, many times that he will have nothing to do with Western New World Order ventures. He, he stated boldly, proclaimed it loudly. He will have nothing to do with the Western hegemony, Western world government. Had many debates with some of the, the globalists, the leaders in the globalist movement. Zbigniew Brzezinski was one that they had a tremendous debate back and forth. The, the, the big new Bravinsky was in Paris and, and Putin was in Moscow and they were just going back and forth. And the end of it was threats. That Russia, you will lose everything. Putin was like, no, I will not, we will stand. And the whole issue then was the Ukraine. Look at what's happening now. Someone tried to convince me now that we have to be in the position that we're in right now with the Ukraine. You cannot. There is no reason for us to be involved in that conflict, especially since we provoked it. We've been provocative about that all along. We, I say we, the Western world, our president. So what's happening, folks? We're being set up for a global exchange of nuclear weapons. And why would they want to do such a thing, knowing what it, knowing what it will cost? Why would they want, why would this system want to, new world order system, why would they want to do something like that? No, not necessarily. So that they can introduce the great cleanup and take away everything you have in the process. Because if there was to be, and listen, this is very current. You're looking at me like, ooh, I can't believe he's talking about this. This is very current, isn't it? Right now as we speak, Putin is talking about launching nuclear weapons against the Ukraine, against NATO. And what are we doing about it? Nothing. We're continuing to be provocative. So what would such an exchange do? Shut down your pocketbooks, destroy your economy, and give everything over to the same entity that's provoking this conflict to begin with. You see, following a nuclear war, there's going to be 10 or 15, 20 years of cleanup of the environment. The environment becomes the idol then. As if it isn't an idol now. It is, folks. Now, this is a somber turn to this, but I'm saying this to tell you that we're coming to the end of this period of redemption. The sixth day, this is, we're coming up to the Shabbat. And the chaos and the mayhem will ensue. It will. It's already happening. Don't look at me like I can't believe he's saying this. You know the book of Revelation. Amen. What happens in the book of Revelation? Two-thirds of humanity die. This is leading up to what? The great Shabbat millennia. When Jesus comes and establishes righteousness in the earth and order, he puts an end to the rebellion. He puts an end to the entities, to the factors that brought this great conflict into being to begin with. He is judge. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And folks, we will do it with him. Don't be blinded. Don't, don't, don't be willfully blinded about what's happening in the world today. Know what's happening. See what's happening. I'm not telling you that you have to become an activist in any regard, but know the reality of what's happening. Why is this important? So that you will not be deceived. So that you will not be misled into complacency and you may not end up taking the mark of the beast as a result. Yes, don't forget that that's on the way, the mark of the beast. The good news is Jesus is preparing this millennial kingdom and it's not far away. Be it 10 years, 50 years, or 100 years, it is not far away. Sukkot is around the corner, folks. And what happens at this time of the year? We can feel the change in the air. The change is coming. This great change is coming. It is not the great change that humanity envisions. That will bring nothing but hopelessness. 
The change that we're beginning to sense in the ear is the coming of Messiah Amen. and his kingdom, his redemption in the earth. Sunday, I'm going to talk about the significance now of the actual sukkah. The sukkah, God gave Israel very specific instructions, instructions as to how to build the sukkah, what the sukkah is supposed to be comprised of. The very, the very pieces, the elements that it's built with, those elements are very significant and does relate to each of us. It does relate to the reality of who we are, folks. It's very symbolic, but it's very accurate. And we'll talk about that on Sunday. So, the great, the great turnover, the great transition. How, what, what's, what's, what's the new world order? You, how are they referring to this great thing right now? The great reset. The great reset. <laughs> Folks, there is a great reset coming. It's inevitable. It's not the reset that, that the new world order is thinking of. It's a different reset. A reset where a new heaven and earth will come into existence. Before that happens, we have a thousand years of Messiah in the earth. Are you looking forward to that? Are you looking forward to that? Is that something that you're excited about? Or are we all wrapped up with our concerns here and now? Should we allow our concerns here and now to govern our, our, our thoughts, our 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 behavior, should we? No. We should set our eyes solely on the kingdom of God and be rejoicing. That's what, that's what Moses said at the end of this most incredible psalm that we're looking at tonight, looked at last week. Rejoice with his people, you nations. This is right at the end of this 6,000-year redemption process. Rejoice. So as dismal as things seem in the earth, the prospect of horrible things coming, we ought to rejoice. We ought to look up, straighten up, Jesus says, for your redemption draws near. We're preparing to celebrate a grand Sukkot when our debts will be remiss. You see, that's the essence of the new creation. The grand Sukkot that comes after seven years or seven millennia is the grand Sukkot where our Again, our debts are completely remiss. We're talking about the great white throne judgment. At the great white throne judgment brings an end to this 7,000 year process of redemption, doesn't it? Yes. And begins the new creation where your debts are completely erased. I'm talking about your, your, your sin debts. You enter into the new creation. You enter into the new creation without any sin at all. Your debt has been remiss, you see. And this is the symbolism of this great, this great Sukkot. Seven years, and then comes a great Sukkot. So let's read here in Revelation now. You know I was headed to, to, towards the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 20. The pages, my pages in the book of Revelation are wearing out quickly. So Revelation chapter 21, here is that great Sukkot, when God will build his Sukkah in the midst of humanity. He will build his temporary dwelling, will become a permanent dwelling then, in the midst of, in the midst of uh, his creation. Chapter 21, I'm going to read for you 1 to 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. This creation will be done away with. God's going to bring about a new creation, a new heaven, a new earth. What would that be like? We can only imagine. And we're allowed to imagine. What would that be like? I talked about Andromeda, that massive galaxy. But Andromeda is a small galaxy compared to some of the galaxies that are being seen by the telescopes that we have in, the, in, in space right now. So consider that. God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. How is he going to, to, to bring this into being? What's he going to do? By faith, just as he created the, the old heaven and the old earth, by faith, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. What will that look like? You're free to expand in your mind what you think that would look like. I believe, and here's what I believe. I want to share with you what I believe about this new heaven and new earth. It will be one mega galaxy. 
the entire universe would be one galaxy, one mass of light and life. No longer divided into billions of masses of light and life, but one. And right at the center of it will be the New Jerusalem. That's what I believe. It's pretty out there, but that's, that's what I believe. New heaven and new earth. Jerusalem will be the center of this new creation. Doesn't that sound succinct? Doesn't that sound feasible? That the new Jerusalem would be the center of this new heaven and new earth that God is creating. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. Let me propose this to you while I'm, while I'm thinking about it. What do you think of the possibility that before the fall, the entire universe was together. Once the fall occurred and rebellion came into existence, everything split up. Division. What comes as a result of sin and rebellion? Division. And ever since then, the universe has been expanding. All of the galaxies are moving away from each other. The picture of rebellion, the picture of division. Perhaps before that moment, it was all one mass. Perhaps. Now, of course, I'm a lunatic from the standpoint of astro astronomers and so on today, right? What am I talking about? <laughs> it's crazy stuff. But you know what? The things of the Bible can easily be misconstrued as being crazy, can't it? Absolutely. So perhaps the redemption is when everything becomes one again. Is God the God of unity, achad? Yachad. Is he the God of unity? Absolutely. So I believe that this new heaven and new earth will be one. And I saw the, new, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the sukkah, the tabernacle of God, is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. This is that grand sukkah. Deaths are remissed. Remiss. No more sin. No more, no more sorrow. No more death. No more mourning. No more crying. And he who sits on the throne says, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give to the one who thirsts from the springs, from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. We, talk, we started talking about Moses and how God gave Moses a wonderful opportunity not to redeem himself, but to, to witness the reality of God's faithfulness. What we just read in Revelation chapter 21 is effectively the same thing. We endeavor in this life, we walk by faith. Do we walk a perfect walk before God? No, we don't. We stumble. We pick ourselves up. Even at the moment of our passing, even though by faith we know that we will inherit eternal life, there's still an element of unsureness, isn't there? If you're human, there will be. Some of it, anyway. But by faith, we know that we will inherit God's goodness and mercy. I do, and I feel sure about it. But, you see, there is always that possibility that, whoa, what, wait a minute, what did I do here? What did I do there? Am I truly, truly forgiven? Well, in the kingdom is when it becomes known. That's when it becomes manifest. What we just read, he will be my son, and I will be his God. I will give to the one who thirsts from the waters of life, from the spring from the waters of life. You see, just as he rewarded Moses, there's a reward for each of us. And this we can have faith in. God's forgiveness of our sins, we can trust God for it, but we can have faith in his reward. Jesus gave us seven examples of rewards in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, didn't he? Each of those rewards are faithful should we overcome, should we endure. Isn't that true? 
Oh, he's preaching a doctrine of works. I don't like that. I don't like the tone of what he's doing tonight. Mm. Works. No, I'm only giving you what the Bible says. Seven times Jesus said it. Seven promises based on our willingness to hear and obey and overcome. Overcome what? The things that encumbers us in this life, the things that we struggle with in this life. So we just came away from Yom Kippur, and believe me, I'm happy. I'm glad that we did. Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is now behind us. I'm going this way. No, I'm going this way. Deal. <laughs> so Yom Kippur is difficult time for people to, to deal with in regards to, as it relates to sin sometimes. People struggle with it. I had a situation where a rabbi uh, went through three or four Yom Kippur's before he decided to come and talk to me about a certain transgression, and he was perplexed. So he spent two or three years struggling. So Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur for some people is a difficult time because they're dealing introspectively with things that have been troubling them and so on and so on. Not with us. Is that true? But yet it's a difficult time for me as a pastor leading a congregation through this time. Because we're, we're dealing with what we dealt with on Wednesday night. Not a pleasant thing. But it's the things that we have to deal with. I'm glad it's behind us. I'm moving forward now to Sukkot. Celebration. Rejoicing. A picture of God's dwelling in the earth. We being that Sukkah. We, the church, being that Sukkah. Which is what we'll talk about on Sunday. The pictures and the, the analogous pictures here are splendid, folks. Splendid, and we ought, to, we ought to be grappling to see them, grappling to understand more, because they're so, they're so very important for us. Gives me purpose. How many, <laughs> everyone's like. <laughs> How many of us struggle for purpose in God's kingdom as we serve God? Purpose, is, is that, is that a, serious, a serious enough issue to even bring up? Yes. Absolutely. Doesn't matter who you are, how well you serve, how much you do, we're always struggling for purpose. Why is that? Because in the Garden of Eden, we've lost our purpose. No matter who you are. Adam, because of that guy, we've lost our purpose. So we're always grappling for purpose. Nothing satisfies us in regards to purpose more than the true message of the kingdom of God. Because I have more purpose now, now that I, I, I know this message, now that I am integrated into the reality of this message, I'm working in the kingdom, I have true purpose. And it's multifaceted, folks. It's not just about, you know, it, it's not one, one dimensional. There are many dimensions to the purposes that God has put before us. And we have, we have so much set before us that we should be clamoring, clamoring to get involved. Clamoring to understand more. Clamoring to dig into the word. God, show me more. Give me more. Sukkot. It's a whole lot there for us. So, next, next Shabbat, from Saturday Shabbat, even on to Sunday, with, with what's happening at Calvary, we're going to celebrate Sukkot. But I want to encourage you as we go forward into Sukkot, from Sunday night going forward, to know the significance of Sukkot. God is preparing to dwell in the midst of his creation once again. And he's going to do so in glory. The glory of God will reside in the midst of his creation. He will make a greater, a greater, greater cre cre creation. One that will surpass everything that we've ever known. Perhaps, again, if I'm correct, and I think I might be, I don't know. He's going to bring the universe back into one yachad. One, one unity, perhaps. Right in the center of it would be the new, the new Jerusalem, where he is, the lamb is there, and so is the bride. It's a beautiful picture. So I want to pray. God, I thank you, Lord, for the good thing that you've done in us, Lord, and you've shown us such wonderful things. God, we pray that you will continue to direct us, Lord. We ask for your spirit to move powerfully in us and we thank you Lord that your spirit 
is in our midst. And you do move in us in power, Lord. And we bless you. We thank you for this. And God, we, we praise you, Lord, for the, for the thing that you're doing. You, the wonderful preparation of your dwelling in the midst of us, in the midst of humanity. God, we consider the futility of humanity. We consider the, 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 the maneuvering of mankind, Lord, and the rebellion that's being built up around us. And we know, Lord, that you have a solution for all of this. And that solution, Lord, is your tabernacle in the midst of Jerusalem, your dwelling. And we thank you, Lord, for this. We thank you, Lord, that we can be a part of this. Use us, O oh Lord, for your, good, for, your good, for your good purposes. Give us even more, Lord. Allow us to know more of your purposes. And we bless you and thank you, Lord and Messiah. Amen.